Akbar's sickness was a severe form of dysentery. His doctors provided him with some strong medicine to help stop the diarrhea, but when he took the medicine, it brought on a severe fever and severe stomach pains. This medicine also prevented Akbar from urinating. So when the doctors tried to reduce the medicine, the diarrhea came back with a vengeance. And it got so bad that Akbar was soon passing blood in his stool. And with Akbar dying, the royal palace was just a buzz with plots and intrigue. Rajaman Singh and Aziz Koka had renewed their efforts to try to drum up support for Prince Khusro over Prince Salim. But when that failed, when they were not able to get enough support for Prince Khusro, they went to Prince Salim and convinced him to make several promises. Two of these promises are very important. The first thing they wanted from him was his promise that if he became emperor, that when he became emperor, he would not seek revenge on those who had supported Prince Khusro. Now, this was very important. Because Rajaman Singh and Aziz Koka and the others who supported Prince Khusro had to worry, had to fear for their lives after Akbar died and Selim became emperor. Well, then they might as well throw in with Prince Khusro right now and take their chances with the civil war. The second thing they wanted from Prince Selim was his promise to protect and uphold Islam and the empire. Even though Rajaman Singh was a Hindu, many people were exhausted with Akbar extreme views on religion and they wanted some stability as far as religion was concerned. Well, Prince Salim agreed to both of these demands and that settled down the plotting that was going on as Akbar was dying. On Akbar's final day of life, he summoned Prince Salim to his room. Throughout nearly a month of sickness, as Akbar was suffering, father and son had been barely seen each other. Prince Salim, for his part, was probably afraid that if he met his father face to face during this period, that Akbar would inform him, would let him know that Khusra would be his successor. But that's not what happened. Akbar motioned for his son to put on the royal robes, put on the royal turban, and to take Humayun's sword. This was a final confirmation that Salim would succeed Akbar as the Mughal Emperor. Akbar died on October 15th, 1605. Let's take a look at Akbar's legacy. Our primary concern is whether Akbar died as a Muslim or not. There is lots of disagreement on that. Let's first acknowledge that Akbar was a spiritual person from the very beginning. We saw this with his early commitment to Sufism and his building of Fatipur Sikri. However, over time, Akbar began to grow disillusioned with the bickering between Muslims of different madhahib or schools of thought. A school of thought in Sunni Islam very similar to a denomination in Protestant Christianity. However, where there are hundreds of denominations, there's only four schools of thought. Now, this disillusionment may have contributed to Akbar leaving Islam. However, he always had a natural curiosity about religion and matters of the spirit. Now, we know that the Hindu influence on Akbar's life led him to almost completely stop eating meat. And we also know that he had lengthy conversations and long discussions with the Jesuit priests in Fatipur Sikri, but there's no evidence that Akbar converted to either Christianity nor Hinduism. Now, we can't ignore the fact that he literally created his own religion. He literally invented a new religion called Dini Lahi in this weird attempt to combine all religions into one, it is possible that this was just as much a political move as it was a religious one. This may have been an attempt by Akbar to limit the power of the ulama class in the Mughal Empire. Ulama is plural for alim and it means scholar. Now, People in the West or non-Muslims often say clerics, but that's not the term that Muslims generally use. We use either the word alim or scholar if we're speaking English. And these scholars or these clerics for you Westerners, they held a lot of power because they were the interpreters of Islam in the Mughal Empire. And this is repeated many times over across many different uh, Muslim empires, kingdoms, and even states even today. Now we'll discuss the influence of the ulama class later 
later on in the season, inshallah, when we're covering the reign of Emperor Aurangzeb. In addition to trying to limit the influence of the alim, of the ulama within the Mughal Empire, Akbar may have passed many of these new rules in order to appease his Hindu wives and Hindu allies. Later on, Prince Salim would say that his father did pronounce his shahada on his deathbed. And there are also quotes from Christians who lived during that time who knew Akbar, who stated that he died as a Muslim. In my personal opinion, and Allah knows best, I believe that he was at best an unorthodox Muslim. And Allah knows best. Prince Selim became the emperor of the Mughal Empire on October 24th, 1605 at the age of 36. He took on the imperial name Nuruddin Jahangir, which means light of religion, conqueror of the world. Emperor Jahangir, we're not going to call him Prince Selim anymore. Emperor Jahangir kept his promise not to seek revenge or take any action against those who had supported his son Khusro. In fact, Emperor Jahangir retained most of the advisors and government officials that had served his father. He appointed Abu Fadl's son to a high position within the army, and perhaps this was an attempt to reconcile for killing Abu Fadl. Ironically, he also gave a hefty reward to Raja Bir Singh Dio, the man who had actually killed Abu Fadl. Another important move by Emperor Jahangir was the appointment of a man named Giyaz Beg to the office of Diwan. As we mentioned before, the Diwan was the Ministry of Finance for the Mughal Empire. Giyaz Beg was a relatively minor Persian bureaucrat who had served during the days of Akbar's rule. But we'll see that he plays a very important role in the Mughal Empire, inshallah. But that discussion is for the next episode. Even though Emperor Jahangir was willing to overlook and forgive his opponent's actions, he was not a fool. He did take steps to minimize their power. For instance, one of the most important things was that he kept his son Prince Khusro by his side in Agra. Khusro, who was about 18 years old at this time, was essentially a prisoner of his father even though his prison was a palace. The next move he did was to appoint Raja Man Singh, who was one of Khusro's primary supporters. Emperor Jahangir appointed him to be the governor of Bengal, which was hundreds of miles away. So that kept those two from having too many interactions. Now let's see how our friends the English were doing around this time. Now England in the late 1500s was not really doing too well. There were some successes, of course. Sir Francis Drake, who was an English privateer, he circumnavigated the earth in 1580. He attacked and plundered Spanish and Portuguese ships, which brought a whole bunch of wealth to the English. And he also helped to repel the Spanish Armada's naval invasion of England in 1588. But otherwise, the English had failed to establish many overseas trading links. But they were well behind the Portuguese and the Dutch who had already had a strong presence in Asia. 